everyone. Welcome back to the Heights podcast. I'm super excited about today's guest. Today we have Mary Harrington on the podcast from the UK. She's a contributing editor of Unheard. Her work has been featured on the London Times, The Spectator, countless other places. And how I kind of got to know Mary Harrington was I first saw her on the uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson podcast where she discussed, they both discussed her book, Feminism Against Progress, which I have right here. I was super interested, loved what she had to say, bought the book, and now I'm just really grateful to have her on this podcast. So Mary, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So in the book, I mean, you address so many awesome topics, uh, important topics, feminism, you discuss different revolutions, uh, birth control pill, gender ideology, and how these different waves of feminism, our different understanding of the human person has had this ripple effect on our culture to now what we see is a lot of short-term commitments, uh, pornography. Now we have the gender ideology, uh, hookup culture and the decline of marriages. So in this, in this episode, everyone, we're going to, we're going to kind of discuss, uh, relationships. Maybe we'll dip our toes into dating and dating culture, uh, get Mary's thoughts on it. Uh, but before we kind of dive into that, Mary, I'd love to just uh, hear what what really inspired you to write uh, this book. Um, it was the very long version of the answer to a question which I've been asking myself for some time, which is, is it possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? Um, which was a question I found myself confronting kind of somewhere around the end of my 20s, the beginning of my 30s, when I realized I didn't believe in progress anymore. I just didn't think it was a thing. At least I couldn't, I couldn't see how you could prove the, that, you know, the arc of history was long, but, it, but, but that it bent towards some kind of improvement in any, in any sort of absolute sense. Um, because like the moment, well, I, I, we'll go down that rabbit hole in a minute. Anyway, I just, I, I realized I just didn't believe progress was a thing. Um, and then I was, and, and that left me kind of scratching my head a bit because I, I'm like, I still, I, I, I still held on to the the values which I'd come into my twenties with, you know, as a long standing, a long standing interest in women's issues, in women's, you know, the the, the specific political challenges that come, they associated with the differences, the difference between the sexes, you know, which has long complicated historical roots and is is entangled in pretty much everything that we do or say or think really is the the fact that men and women are different um or even are men and women different yeah i mean it's all it's all kind of up for grabs apparently now um but this is this has always been something that preoccupied me you know from from actually quite a young age because um it was i was confronted by it in, in my own family life as the the only daughter in a family with two brothers um and yeah it was it was an issue it was an issue and a set of questions which i was confronted with at home in terms of the way my family life worked in the way in the way my my parents interacted um i was i was left with a lot of questions and a certain amount of frustration about about some of those patterns which i took brought with me into adult life you know because you you realize it's not it's not just your home you know this is actually this it feels like it this opens a window on a much bigger set of questions that great many other women and some men have been thinking about for a long time um so this was this was a a, a set of and, and by the time i reached adulthood um you know, we were we were into we were into the we were into the foothills of of the current sort of gender episode. Um, I, I read Judith Butler for the first time at university, and that kind of fried my brain. But although actually at the time I thought it was I thought it was a pretty cool set of ideas because it seemed to offer a solution to a whole load of the really intractable problems which I really wrestled with. You know about you know how how the world constructs you based on your physiology and how. How, how, how it's possible to show up in the world, you know, given, given the givens of our own physiology. And Judith Butler's solution seemed, you know, as I understood it, and I think as a lot of other, a lot of others have understood it since, seemed to be that you, you can kind of create yourself or that, you know, it might theoretically be possible to kind of chip away at those received ideas, even, you know, the level of physiology such that we can, we can create ourselves in a much freer sense without Without being constrained by those givens, so that was that was kind of the worldview I brought with me, or kind of the 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 utopia that that I I, I travelled with when I arrived in adult life. Um, my you know, my twenties was a hot mess, I, and by the by the time I got to the end of all of that, I had some questions about whether or not that utopia was actually 
make did actually made any sense. Um, and also, I didn't believe in progress anymore because you know, <laughs> yeah, nine. It, well, the, my, the the beginning of my questioning progress, I guess, was probably nine eleven, and the end of it was the global financial crash. You know, which uh, I suppose for at least some of your viewers will feel like ancient history. You know, that's maybe the year they were born. Or, um, it certainly, certainly, kind of, you know, they were still in, they were, they, they were still at preschool, and all of that was happening. But for me, those were those were the kind of formative um, punctuation marks of political punctuation marks of my of my young adulthood. Um, so my first the the beginning of the end with nine eleven and the end of the beginning of the end. So really, the end of the end the begin the end of history mm -hmm. with the global financial crash. You know, and we're, we're somewhere quite different now. I think that's pretty clear to everybody at this point. But it all yeah, it was all very uncertain at the time. Anyway, so so there I am, you know, it's the year of the global financial crash, you know, my, my, my house share is falling apart underneath me, you know, the all the, the whole sort of queer thing is starting to feel very questionable. You know, I'm suddenly like, I don't, I, I'm actually not sure. I'm no longer convinced that things can only get better, as in the Tony Blair sense. I, I just don't buy it anymore. It seems it seems implausible based on everything everything I've tried up to this point. Um, this this no longer feels like a credible way of approaching the world. And yet, I still think women. You know, there I still I still believe. You know, at some pretty irreducible level, that there are political questions which arise from the differences between the sexes, which are intractable. You know, they might have a slightly different uh, layout to what I what I believed up to that point, but I don't feel like they've. I don't feel like that polit that set of political questions has gone away just because I don't believe in progress anymore. Um, but yeah, but this is a real head scratcher for me um, because the like the whole history of feminism is very bound up in the in this sort of utopian narrative of progress as a kind of ongoing thing, sort of all the way off into the future. There I am, sort of gesturing yeah. into some kind of out, 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 out of my window. <laughs> Um, so, what, yeah, Mary, Mary, what you mean by progress? Can you kind of just define okay, that a little bit? Me, Do you mean just by opera, like just more opportunities or more kind of like freedom to well, choose? Well, exactly. Well, well, exactly. You know, because it's the point, the point where I, I started kind of interrogating the idea of progress, I realized I wasn't the first person to have questions. And, you know, and Christopher Lash wrote. He, he, he's he, he's written a whole. The, the True and Only Heaven is a is a sort of canonical now critique of the the of progressivism, if you like, the the secular idea of progress um, as a sort of. Um, and the more I, yeah, and there are there are some post there are some more recent post liberal critiques of that idea as well. Yeah, and the and the, these all sort of converge on on a reading of the idea of progress as a kind of secular eschatology. You know, it's a it's a version of death, judgment, heaven and hell, which has just taken the transcendent bits out and, and, and offers instead this a, a, a version, a version of the eschaton, which nobody's quite sure what happens there. But somehow all of our problems have gone away and all of the things which are wrong with with the world as it is have gone away. But somehow we're all still just here in the secular, material, temporal world. And it's all just happened in the here and now. Yeah, so like I mean, the 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 end of never-ending progress, um, which never ends because you can never actually get there, um, is immunitizing the eschaton. You know, in the in the sort of William William F. Buckley sense, if that's not too abstruse a way of looking at it. But and but and the point when I realize I sort of figured this out by thinking, well, you know, how how do you actually? And this, this is just the stuff I think about in the shower, right? I'm like, okay, so so if if we're if 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 progress is a thing, then how do you prove it? Like how do how do we know that you know how do how do we know that we're better off now in some absolute sense than we were in some in say ancient Rome or I don't know ancient Egypt you know and pick pick any random point in the past which people oh you know you don't want to go back to the Middle Ages it was very bad then it's like okay um, maybe I don't but like how do you how do you establish that in some kind of absolute sense that things are objectively better now than they were in the Middle Ages like sure some things are definitely better now than they were in them you know I'm less likely to die of leprosy than I would have been in the Middle Ages you know I probably have you know at least on some metrics more political freedom than I would have had in the Middle Ages um, but you know it's like um, it, it's difficult, you know, how, how am I supposed to ascertain in some absolute sense that, you know, the total sum of virtue and felicity and, you know, all of the other, all of the other metrics we might use for, for you know, aggregate total well-being are absolutely better now than they were then. I think that's just, it, it, it's just, that just seems to me completely, a, you know, it's a, it's an unfalsifiable claim, which is to say it's a metaphysical belief. You know, that's just a, that's just a complicated way of saying that this is a belief, not a fact. 
And fine, you know, there are there are some things which there there are some statements, there are some claims which it's meaningful and important to make, which don't live in the realm of empirical fact. They live in the realm of belief. You know, the the entirety of the entirety of uh, religious faith lives in that realm. But but at that point, I realised that this is actually what we're looking at. You know, what we're looking at here is not a, a statement of empirical fact. What we're looking at here is a, is essentially a, a very carefully disguised um, religious claim. Um, and 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 at that point, I realised, you know, of course, it's a carefully disguised religious claim because it's fundamentally, you know, it's the it's Christian eschatology, just just with the transcendental bits sanded off, um, <laughs> and, and and you know, in a in a business suit with a spreadsheet rather than like. Um, <laughs> You know, waving wa- wa- waving religious symbols around, and and it's taken out the death judgment. It's taken out the the, the account of human nature. It's taken account, taken out the account of God. It's taken out the account of the next life, um, and and you know all, all the transcendental bits. And it's and all it's left with is is the sense of directionality and you know things perhaps being better in the end somehow. So and I was just like, I don't I don't buy it. Um, I don't see why I don't see why this is the, this this account doesn't make. I, I don't believe this account. It's just not. I don't buy it. Yeah. Yeah, but you know how how do I how do I, and then then I you know it's, it's, I I, t- I take a shower every day I I have to think um, so I'm and and by by this point you know just to give you a sense of where I was in my own life by this point I'd stopped believing in progress I'd left London my whole life fell apart concurrently with the global financial crash you know it was it was the end of history for me as well in some painful ways um, and by the time I kind of by the time I came out of how sort of shocking and disorienting that change was for me i'd left london i was married i lived in small town england and i had a kid um and and, and so so then i found myself sort of pushing pushing a buggy around the streets of small town england kind of still thinking about these things and and thinking and and, and this this is this really kind of reopened a lot of the feminist questions for me um because there you know so suddenly i'm a mum and i'm confronted in a much more concrete way with a lot of the a lot of the a, a, a lot of the kind of stated the, the un the un or understated issues which which prompt um a divergence in life path between men and women um you know really really the rubber hits the road when you have kids on so many of those questions um because up up to that point at least if you if you do a sort of modern 21st century knowledge worker type job um it do, it actually really doesn't matter very much whether you're male or female right? i mean i can I could be, you know, in in theory, there's no there's no obvious reason why a 25 year old um, lawyer or management consultant should perform any particularly differently, ir- irrespective of his or her sex. I mean, what difference does it make? Right? You know, you're, you're you're driving a spreadsheet. You're driving a spreadsheet. You know, it, so so the, there's no sort of there's no obvious there's no very. I mean, people can argue the argue the toss about brain sex, but like that's we won't get won't go into that. But like the, there's no there's no obvious physiological reason. Whereas by by contrast, say if you work on an oil rig, you know, like whether and like the the your average upper body strength is probably much more significant. Or you know, if you're a subsistence farmer in the Middle Ages, it's definitely more significant. And under those circumstances, you know, things fall out quite naturally into a sexed division of labour. Um, but in the modern world, that's sort of not really there. So most of most, so 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 actually, um, for for most modern knowledge workers, it doesn't make very much difference what sex you are. Um, and so you know, the the feminist pursuit of absolute equality across the board kind of makes sense until it stops making sense, which is when you have kids. And at that point, at that point, something kind of irreducible comes into the picture. You know, there's only one sex that can gestate. You know, never, never mind, never mind the best efforts of, um, you know, the the of big fertility. There's still only one sex that can gestate. And there's still only one sex that can breastfeed. Um, and there's still only one. And 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 that, how you feel about your kids on average. You know, this this isn't just my my anecdotal story. And there's you've, the there's plenty of research that indicates that the neuro that neurophys- neurophysical changes take place in both parents in parents of both sexes so men and women um have, have experienced their brains quite fundamentally changed by the experience of, of having of raising a child and loving a child um but that's but but the the process of going through pregnancy sort of accelerates that for for women in a way in a way which does, you know, dads eventually catch up, but it just takes a little bit longer. Whereas the, the actually the the experience of gestating sort of primes you for a for a kind of for, for the for the parental bond, specifically the maternal bond, in a way in, in a way in a way which works a little bit differently for adoptive parents or for dads. 
Um, and these and these things all um, these things all sort of land quite hard. Or certainly they landed quite hard for me, particularly in the context of my kind of my my kind of Judith Butlerish history, and particularly in the context of my 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 older earlier. Um, really quite ardent desire for there to be no meaningful differences politically between men and women. Um, you know, and, and yet here I, here I suddenly am. And actually I don't think we should be taking, we, we should be you know, nitpicking about precise 50, 50 divisions of labor, because that's just obviously absurd when only one of you can breastfeed. Um, and it's, it's also obviously absurd when actually I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing. Um, professionally than looking after my baby who's who's literally only just being born and furthermore I feel really bizarre and my hormones are all over the place and I feel like I'm going yeah and I'm I'm, I'm up several times in the night and actually I'm just grateful for the fact that um, somebody else is keeping keeping our kind of external family life going while I'm able to focus on that and suddenly actually the 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 division the the the, the division of those roles between the two of us feels like a good thing rather than a bad thing and then later on, you know, for, for the for the first time, um, I, I think it was, you know, fast forwarding a couple of years, um, you know, my, my husband said, do you want to go back to work? You know, at that point, I mean, in, a, in the UK, I, I know it's quite, it varies a lot more in the US, but in the UK, you can take up to you can take up to a year of maternity leave with six months of it paid. That's just a statutory right that mothers that mothers have so most of the women who i had who, who had kids around the same time as me in my prenatal group had still had gone back to work i think there was only one other mum who wasn't and my, and my husband said to me do, do you want to go back to work um and i and i thought about it and i thought i don't know not really you know i mean i've been terrible at every job i'd done up until that point i really just left i was functionally unemployable by the time i had my had our daughter um and and I just I couldn't really think of anything I wanted to do more than looking after her, you know. It was I I, I, I had quite a nice life, and at that point I realised that you know a, a really quite basic belief I'd had, which was that um, there was something there was something sort of fundamentally structurally unjust about about the the quote unquote traditional um, division of division of childcare and earning, if, if, if the, the sort of industrial era one. Um, and I'd always thought that, that that the only reason that could possibly have happened would, would, was must necessarily have been because women were oppressed. Um, certainly, in, you know, my in my childhood, it hadn't felt as though my mum was having the greatest time. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, but at that point, I was watching I was watching my peers from from prenatal class going back to work, and some of them were pretty miserable about it. And they didn't want to be going back to work even after a year. I know, in, I know, in the US. You know, so there are there are plenty of mums who have to go back to work much sooner than that, and the idea of a whole year with your baby is probably quite radical, Sandy, at least in some. Um, and and yet, you know, here they were, you know, they were they were experiencing what what looked like a kind of a kind of partial bereavement and just absolutely hating it. I mean, no, you know, not not in every case certainly, but you know, in many cases they were they they were not really they were not really very happy about it at all. And I was thinking, no, actually, even ha like having the choice. Which I didn't realise I'd had up until that point was a, it wasn't it wasn't oppression it was privilege, um, and that that started me thinking about the whole that started me thinking in in different ways about the the relation between feminism and progress. Um, so there I am, sort of pushing pushing a buggy around the streets and thinking about all of these things and thinking about the relationship between feminism and progress. Um, and eventually, eventually, I figured out the you know, and this this question that I had is it possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? And eventually, I, the the conclusion I came to was that yes, it's possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress. But it depends a bit what you mean by feminism, and it depends a bit what you mean by progress. Um, and I, uh, and the the way I decided to try and make sense of that was to define what what we mean by progress a bit more precisely. Um, is as as a as a series, not, you know, not, not a kind of, not, not to take it out of the eschatological frame, you know, this kind of um, cons covert, covert sort of Christian arc of, of, of the moral universe and, and to see it more concretely in terms of tech transitions. Um, you know, the story, as in the story that we tell ourselves about freedom and um, abundance isn't, is, is, you know, that if, if you like those, those things are effects rather than causes. And actually what's, what's driving those, those apparent so that apparent trajectory of never ending progress is a series of tech transitions, which is to say the industri the industrial the industrial era and and more recently 
um, our shift into a new era, which is the which is to say the the modern um, the modern digital one, um, which I, elsewhere which I've, I've called the cyborg era. I guess we might get onto that in a little while. Um, and and I and I began to and from that point of view, it sort of made more sense to me to think about to to understand why and how these the these tech transitions had come had, had seemed, feels the why the story of progress seems so bound up in uh, the story of feminism because each one of these tech transitions has in turn has a transformative effect on the way men and women relate to one another because of course it does because you know when 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 our whole sort of social and cultural and material and economic environment changes so does family life um so so of course of, of course technology you know the, the industrial revolution didn't just didn't just change how we how we drive around you know in cars rather than horse drawn cars um it also changed every aspect of how we organize our social lives including family life and and this is this is what ended up being the story i told in the first third of feminism against progress it is a re, a, if you like sort of re reading the history of feminism as a series of tech transitions um so firstly firstly the the history of feminism up to the second wave as a story of industrialization and how women responded to that. Um, and, and if you look at, if you look at the first wave of feminism as, as a response to the industrial revolution, it all, it all makes a whole lot more sense. You know, they hadn't, they didn't just all wake up one day and decide, Oh, we want the vote because reasons um, they were, they were responding very legitimately to, to a whole, to re absolutely incredibly far reaching changes, um, you know, including well, but centrally, the, the the bleeding away of productive work from the home, which um, which had previously been, if you like, the central economic unit. So in the in, in the Middle Ages, you know, the productive household was where work happened. Um, you know, whether and, and most of it was subsistence work. Most of it wasn't bound up in the in the market economy as it is now. So most of it wasn't waged work, but it was, you know, for example, processing raw materials for the family or or, or growing or growing or raising or otherwise producing raw material so they could be processed. And all of that work was gendered. Um, so so it was it was understood as either men's work or women's work. Um, and, and 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 very bound up in sort of incredibly, you know, varied and locally specific and culturally and historically specific um, local rituals and, and social practices. Um, but but all, all of it at all times very deeply gendered. And it's only really with the introduction of, um, of industrialization that 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 those those kinds of work began to leave the home, and actually it was women's work, which which, well, it it was it, physically it was men who left the home to to go and work in factories and offices, but it, but in but at the same time as men began to leave the home and take work, if you like, you know, waged work, economically productive work elsewhere. Also, the women, the the work that women had previously done in the home also began to leave the home. So, so the the kinds of the kind of processing of raw materials into subsistence goods for the family was increasingly something which happened in factories, and then you just go and buy the goods. So, you know, instead of making butter, you go to the shop and you buy it. Instead of you know, in, instead of weaving weaving textiles, you know, you just you can go to the shop and you can go to the shop and, and buy buy a roll of fabric, or even just get or go to the shop and just buy some buy ready made clothes. And so, so, so the the entire fabric of social life changes, and in turn, that that transforms the power relations between men and women. You know, and I'm, and all of this all of this should be should be taken with the important caveat that you know this 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 isn't to suggest that that medieval life was a kind of rosy bucolic picture necessarily you know humans hum, you know, <laughs> human nature is what it is and you know we always we you know we we suck sometimes and there are plenty of plenty of things about, <laughs> about that you know that there, there are plenty of incidents you can find where people were not particularly good to one another and when men and women treated each other terribly as we still do now um, but it was but the, the the key point that i want to get across is that is that the, the, the central economic unit of work was the household under those circumstances, that changed in the industrial era, um, but it but that left women with a dilemma because on the one hand, on 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 the one hand, you're not you're not working in the same way as you used to have been. So you might have been making making weaving textiles or you know churning butter or whatever with your kids underfoot. You can no longer combine work and family life in the same way. Like the whole idea of work life balance, as we as we've had it ever ever since, just wasn't really a thing in a productive household because it was just all mixed in together. Um, and all of a sudden, this is a predicament that that women have because someone's still got to look after the kids. You know, if you're if you're going to have kids, 
Um, but you've also got to earn money because you've got to go and do a 12 hour shift in a factory, which is three miles away. That's, that's quite a different, that's, a, that's quite a different predicament than if you're sort of weaving with kids underfoot at home. Um, and so, so women had a whole load of new challenges to, to deal with. Um, and some of, and wherever possible, um, where, wherever possible women solved those by, by just relinquishing paid work. Rel relinquishing productive economic productivity and focusing more on on the care of children at home, which is to, and, and and this this gave rise to a whole sort of discourse of bourgeois domesticity and you know the angel by the hearth and, and, and there's a there's a huge body of literature which more recent feminist historiographers have tended tended to read as some sort of fifth column for the patriarchy, but I I see it I see it as a it, as a kind of feminism in the sense that they're trying to make the case for uh, for for care and for for the for, for the, the the importance of the of the of the sphere of caring um even even in a context where where most of the economically productive work which had pre hitherto happened within the home around that uh, that 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 work of caring for dependents um had had bled away elsewhere when we're saying no this stuff still really matters and we and we and we still we still need to make a case for it so i think we're, so we're just going to we're so, so, so we're going, we're going to just focus on that, you know, the education of children and the raid and, and, you know, making a nice home. And, 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 and I see, I see that as a sort of feminist defense of, um, of, a, a mode of caring which had been left, as it were, very exposed by the departure of economic, economically productive work from, from the home. So that's, that, that's sort of the industrial era. But then against that, there are also those women who found themselves economically dependent now. Um, within, with it, as supposed angel by the hearth, but married to guys who were not good guys, who were not good husbands, um, and who found themselves, you know, still at the mercy of a legacy legal system, uh, which was set up for the productive household. So men and women were considered one unit because they were, they were in aggregate the productive household. And so women, and, and this is the context in which we now, we now tell the story about how women didn't have political personhood as such, but it was more that, you know, the, the, the political personhood of both, of both of, of the adults of, of the whole family was 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 understood as one unit and and the man was the titular head of that which is just very difficult to get your get your head around from the from the point of view of a, of a sort of tax and political system we have now where everybody's understood as individual but they just didn't think about it like that they didn't really think about people as individuals necessarily at all you had a kind of corporate um existence as as a household um, yeah. And so, so you arrive. You effectively, you're now you're now in a in a market society where, in practice, you're already being treated as an individual. But politically, the 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 the, the legal the legal and cultural environment hasn't caught up with it. And so, so, so then, what happens? What happens if your husband treats you badly? You know, you have you know you you no longer have resource have have resort to the the whisper network in the village, which can socially ostracize a husband and kind of control control bad actors in that way, and all of the other all of the other kind of covert forms of of, of soft power that 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 pre modern pre modern societies traditionally accorded to women. Yeah, all, all of that all of that stuff is now radically. Um, attenuated and and women are women, women and under the, in those circumstances were desperately vulnerable to bad actors and there are some real horror stories um i've, I've detailed some of them in the book and, and and in that context those women who campaigned for women's existence as you know political persons and legal persons in their own white in in their own right were, were right to do so and they were justified in doing so and so out of that you get the campaign for property ownership you get the campaign for the vote you get the campaign for um, the right to work and you get the campaign for really for women to enter the market on the same terms as men. But then there's, but then out of this arises a real tension between those women who are making the case in, in, in the context of this new, this new industrialized world for care and domesticity and those women who are making the case also on feminist terms for individual personhood on the same terms as men. Because actually those two things don't really add up. You know, care and domesticity is predicated on on women being struck, being different, and, and our roles being fundamentally different. And you know, legal personhood on the same terms as men is predicated on 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 is premised on women being fundamentally the same as men. And so, which one which one is it? You know, are we waves mm -hmm. or are we particles? Uh, <laughs> it's it's a problem, and that and that sort of and and it's a it, that that's really the kind of creative dialectic which informs all of feminism all the way up to the second wave. Which is which is in the 1960s, at which point, at which point, as I've as I've told the story in Feminism Against Progress, that dialectic was resolved in favour of sameness over diff over diff of individuality over care, 
uh, freedom over care, if you like, or sameness over difference um, by another tech transition, which was which was our arrival in the transhuman era. Well, I think I called it the cyborg era rather than the transhumanist era in the book. But I mean, it's, we're basically we're basically talking about yeah. the same thing. We have a kind of our, our, our merger with our own technologies. You know, the point where we started to industrialize ourselves. Mm-hmm. And Mary, I have a, I have a question. Uh, when you talked about, um, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, that it was the family was just a unit and it was almost like considered that man and woman, husband and wife were their one subject acting together the and then out of that due to maybe oppressive men they're justified to say hey we want the right to vote and have just more freedom to choose so to speak was that do you know if like did women like the idea or the majority like the idea that um we're going to kind of make a decision together and then the man will go off and vote where i don't have to vote did 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 most women like that or it's very it's it's quite hard to it's quite hard to figure out what was going on and and I I've got to be honest I don't know very much about this about the the story of of women's suffrage in the United States I know a little bit more about what happened in the UK um as far as I can make out there was a genuine um fairly robust um female support for not having the vote you know there were, there were there were lots of the the the, the 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 there was a very well mobilized anti women's anti suffrage campaign in the UK, which is just very it's very weird again to think about that now because we have such a kind of teleological account of the women's liberation movement. But there were a lot of women who really who really just they either didn't care or they wanted to be left alone or they genu or they genuinely wholeheartedly thought it was a bad idea. Um, I mean, it's to to be clear. Um, this and none of this is to suggest that it would be a good idea to go back to not having the vote now yeah. because actually the material the, the political and the material circumstances we're in now are so different and and the and women's rationale then for for, for saying no actually women shouldn't have the vote was that I, the, the the most commonly i mean for, from the men's side it was all oh you know women are too silly and emotional but from the women's side it, it wasn't it wasn't all of that um it was much more women have enough power already um, and really, what really here we're we're talking specifically about bourgeois women, um, who who were very well organised. You know, they they basically ran civil society in the nineteenth century. You know, they ran phenomenally well organised. They they were they were skilled institution builders. They they ran social reform movements. They ran poor relief. You know, everything everything which now has been nationalised or you know, formalised or institutionalised as the welfare state and everything, every every institution that we now think of as sort of state operated um, modes of caring um, and, and support for the poor, pretty much any one of those that you care that you care to look at was was invented in the 19th century by bourgeois women um, who wanted who, who wanted to make life better for the poor in the context, again, of an industrial revolution, which completely up, up uprooted everything you know including including settled ways of life and, ma- and made life you know truly unpleasant and um, degrading for a, for, for a lot of the poorest and in, in, in factories and so on um, particularly yeah. particularly in this sort of you know rapidly developing urban uh, polities where, where life was just profoundly squalid so so you get these you, you what, what now reads is these, these sort of terrible pompous do-gooders who turn up and kind of you know to try and yeah. tell poor people how to live their lives but under the circumstances you know it was probably probably good because actually like life you know like life, life in the industrial slums was pretty grim and you know and and so so all of the all of these church ladies would turn up and try and make it a little bit better and you know out, out of this was later born the, the welfare state um, but but at, at the time, the church ladies said, "No, no, actually, you know, we don't, we don't want political power in, you know, in um, in formal, in, in formal terms, because we're, we're we're already we're already everywhere, doing this stuff. Hmm. We are the welfare state, so you know, we don't we we, we don't need we don't need that that power as well. And there was also there was also a set of arguments, you know, at the slightly more abstract level from the." Yeah, and this is this is specifically in the context of the British Empire, which we don't have anymore, obviously. But at the time, um, though, the the more literary female anti-suffragists said because women can't fight in wars and they're not generally involved in heavy industries such as shipbuilding, for example, um, or 
I don't know, resource extraction or whatever. Um, it doesn't make sense for women to be wielding political power when they're not able to follow through by, for example, fighting for their country. So, and so actually we should, we, so, so, and, and, and those women argued for, for women's, for the female franchise at the local government level, but not at the imperial level. And they drew a clear distinction. I suppose the equivalent for the, in the United States might be saying women should have the vote at state, but not federal level. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, 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 yeah. and I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't really know. I don't know the details yeah. of, of, of suffragism in, in the US. But, but anyway, that, that was how it that was how it went down in the UK. Um, and there was there, there was a you know, I'd, I'd hesitate to say there was a silent majority against it. But I think a lot of women just didn't really care either way. Yeah. And, and against this, there were the, there were the, the progressive women who were who were very vociferously in favor of it. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, that's a very that's a lengthy answer to your question. Yeah. But no, totally. Yeah. So, and then going back to, so, um, you know, now we're in the, you know, the cyborg transhumanist era and you kind of emphasize just the, you know, the birth control pill as kind of the first, oh, yes. uh, I've once heard you say the transhumanist technology, which severed, really severed, you know, procreative from the unitive, um, severed sex from responsibility and babies. And I, yeah, in your book, you just talked about, you know, this de-risk sex, um, and ultimately I, you know, I think what you're trying to hint at is it's kind of led to a totally different view of marriage, sex, and then because of that relationships and, and dating. And I think maybe this is the kind of the wave of, you know, freedom for progress mm -hmm. is more, more opportunity, more choice, more individual autonomy. So, right. uh, right. maybe you can yeah pick up back on. Um, now we're in the transhumanist or cyborg era. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think the, the the argument that I wanted to make about about the about uh, uh, yes the the birth control pill um, I see very much as the first transhumanist technology in the sense that it's it's the first time we've used a medical technology not to not to fix something that's broken. So you know, let's, let's say I have a headache, you know. I, or, you know, I have a broken arm, you put a cast on my arm, and, you know, you give me painkillers until my arm is fixed. I go see a doctor for that. You know, that's that, that sort of take, taking taking a basic template of normal health and saying, OK, something something is wrong with normal health. My arm is broken. Please fix it. And then I'll be I'll be normally healthy. Um, yeah. That, that's sort of predicated on the idea that 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 healthy is a thing. The, we, we have a sort of normative picture of what, what a healthy, thriving human normal looks like for, for men and for women. And, and what's what's so radically different about the contraceptive pill is that it doesn't set out to fix something relative to that template of normal. It looks at that normal and says, so something about this, or something about normal, which is just a nuisance here. And so we're going to, we're going to break it in the name of human freedom. Because that's what the pill does if, 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 if you follow. That's what the pill does in relation to, I mean, it's not fixing something that's broken. It's fixed, it's breaking normal female fertility in the name of personal freedom. Um, so, and there's something, and, and, and relative, relative to every, every accepted practice of medicine up to that point, this is a, this is a totally radical departure. And, and in turn, it opens the door for, it, it invites the question, okay, so what else could we, what else, what else about human, about the human template could we re-engineer in the name of personal freedom or desire or will or commerce or, I don't know, anything else? You know, does this, does this mean that, does this mean that human nature is now, is now open to, open to re-engineering and, and that I mean and, and that that really is that that's the sort of central metaphysical claim of transhumanism that the that human that the normal normal human physiology isn't is either that it's not really a thing or that we're entitled to re-engineer re it to suit to suit ourselves and this is just not something that medicine had had really considered think like on the table at all up to that point and since and since since the birth control pill put it on the table um, you know just in the name of people people being able to have risk-free sex um, you know, a great many, a great many other things downstream of that have now become up for up for negotiation. You know, the the, the fact that children need two parents, for example, the fact that both that, that every, every child's parents need to be, you, you need one parent of either sex. That's on the table now. The fact that the 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 person, the fact that your father, the father and the mother who raise you are also the people who provided the sperm and the egg. That's also up for grabs. Uh, up for re renegotiate. I mean, you know, <laughs> and it, it pretty much doesn't matter how far how far down the rabbit hole you go. So, so suddenly, it's all on the table. It's all up for. It's all open for re-engineering. You know, can we can, can can we can we tinker with fertilized embryos in order to make them more intelligent? 
is is that okay? You know, th- th- this is this is simply not a question that would have been askable um, until until we and, until we accepted in principle that it, that that it's legitimate to re-engineer the the normal human template in the name of individual individual preference. And 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 now, so 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 that's so that's the paradigm that we've been in really for fifty years. Um, the, which is mean, very straightforwardly, a, a much more banal. You know, people tend to talk about transhumanism as though you know we're going to have you know people walking around with kind of eight arms or you know ro- robot ro- robot tentacles growing out of their forehead or something. But it's much more banal than that. It's really just you know we, we we've discarded in principle the idea that there, that there exists a normal human physiological template, and instead we've just opened all of that for to. It, we've just made it all, all up for grabs, and and really the and I've drawn on the example of the birth control pill. Don't worry, I'll get back to relationships and dating in a minute. This is just all. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 I drew on I, I drew on that example because I because I wanted to show that we have fifty years of receipts for what it looks like when you set out to re-engineer human nature when you set out to re-engineer human normal, um, and. And, and what it looks like is that you might you might think that what you're getting is progress in the sense of more more freedom and more abundance, um, but what you're actually getting, um, you, you, yes, you'll get more freedom, but you'll also whatever it is that you've you've dissolved in the name of freedom will also be opened up to the market. So along with more freedom, you will also get more trade, and and whether or not that that nets out in your favour depends a great deal on where you're standing. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if you're like some Silicon Valley billionaire, then it's probably going to net out in your favor. I mean, you can have, you can have 12 kids and just buy a compound and, you know, and, 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 you know, commission more of them by a surrogacy and do what you like, or, you know, polygenic embryos screen them for intelligence and maybe that'll work. I don't know. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're an impoverished woman in Mexico, who's and the only way you can make rent is by selling your eggs or, or renting your uterus and somebody's based, somebody is treating you as a, as a piece of real estate. Um, for a for, for a Chinese baby buyer over, overseas, and then requiring you to abort at twenty four weeks because reasons, you know the, that's quite a different picture. Something that you're looking, or or indeed, you know, as as has already happened in numerous occasions, um, if you're you're trafficked from one country to another for, for gestational surrogacy, this is actually happening. Um, we're, we're, women are no longer just even being trafficked for sex. We're being, we're, women are being trafficked for gestational surrogacy, which I mean, it's both full full on nightmare fuel. About those kinds of stories, and and my and, and what I really want, you know, and where, where I've, I've drawn on the contraceptive pill is to show that actually that began that the moment we began technologizing women's fertility um, through through the contraceptive pill, that immediately opened up women's women's bodies to to the market. Yes, it gave it gave a, particularly middle class women a great deal more freedom. I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm a beneficiary, you know, I reckon it's, it's netted out in my favor, you know, in terms of access to higher education, access to the workplace, you know, and, the, and, and a whole transformation of the social environment such that I have a great deal more freedom probably than, than a woman of my, a, a woman of my class would have in say 1920, perhaps, I don't know. But on, on balance, it's probably worked out in my favor, but, but, What's but what's come with that is 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 an exponential commercialization of of women's sexuality, which in my view and not just in my view um, is I don't think that aspect of the sexual revolution has netted out in total to women's to women to women's benefit at all. Um, I mean, and I took the example of pornography, for for instance, which which began to skyrocket the moment the contraceptive pill became normalized, because of course it did. You know, so you you can you 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 can now photograph or film sexual intercourse um, without worrying that the that the woman who's participating, who's who that's being done to, is going is going to get pregnant every time. Um, so so of course it. Uh, and and furthermore, and the fact the fact that women the the fact that sex is taken out of management by the social by your social context because people no longer really have a no like the wider society no longer has a stake in in what i do or who i do it with because pregnancy is so radically de-risked and so so in in a sense it becomes it becomes possible thinkable for the first time that that sex is nobody else's business whereas previously for women that just wasn't true you know who who i had sex with as an 18 year old girl absolutely was my parents business <laughs> because if i if i get pregnant and the dad's nowhere to be found that's that's not just my that's not just my problem that's my whole community's problem um you know what what do you do with the baby you know and the history has a long set a long list of you know usually not very happy answers to that question but you know it's a it's a it's an eternal it's an eternal thing it's an eternal mm. social challenge 
Um, and suddenly the contraceptive pill comes along. And of course, everyone's really thrilled with this because, you know, sudden, so it, it feels as though we can make that problem go away or we can make it really just a matter of individual choice for the first time. Um, but of course, you know, the moment, the moment something, something is much, so the, the moment I own something and nobody else does, I'm free to buy and sell it. So, so along with, along with the, the increase in sexual autonomy for young, young fertile women comes for the, for the first time a libertarian defense of the sex industry. You, you can see how that follows, um, and so and, and and so you know it, by the end by the end by really the early nineteen seventies, women are marching against the the mushrooming of the porn industry. The same feminists who celebrated the arrival of the pill are, are really are, are furious about the downstream consequences of the pill, which is which is the sex industry. And by the nineteen eighties, there are full on in, if the, there's a full on war within feminism over 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 the meaning of over what pornography means and on the one hand you've got libertarian feminists saying no this is this is about this is about sexual autonomy and on the other hand you have radical feminists saying no this is this is about the oppression of vulnerable women and and in in those wars in those wars it was the libertarians that won i mean they're 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 at war again now in the context of another tech transition which is the digital revolution um because pornography is just so much bigger as a and the and, and so much more available and and so much more disgusting as well yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that, that now they're fighting that battle all over again and i i wouldn't be surprised if if you end up if we end up with a different answer this time around because because the technological environment has changed so but but really i mean all of this all of this really to say you know that we have that the the con the, the downstream consequences of engineering ourselves are invariably both freedom, which, you know, the my, my freedom to to plan my own life without worrying that I'm going to get that I either have to live like a nun or uh, worry about pregnancy all the time. But but set against that, the commodification of women's bodies. And if you if you look pretty much any other any other area of transhumanist engineering, you know, the engineering of human beings that's followed in the wake of the contraceptive pill, you'll you'll see the same pattern. On the one hand, more freedom to to engineer your own babies or to you know defer defer having kids or to outsource gestation or whatever and but but then also also a, a, a mushrooming of of commerce um and and often it's incursion into areas where it's just really quite icky it, it, quite so it, it, when people think about turning turning those for t- turning for example babies into commodities most people certainly in in the in this christian legacy west recoil from from that idea that we might be able to that there might there might really be a market for babies that's just um i mean that, that that's so far that's so far outside what i, I personally consider morally acceptable that uh, i don't <laughs> i don't really know what to say to people who, who who offer a libertarian defense of that but um but the but the logic the logic follows uh, uh as as night follows day where, where, wherever wherever more freedom is enabled by technology there also you will have more commerce um and that's that's as true that's as true in technologizing um, having babies as it was true of technologizing having sex um and this that sort of brings us up to where we are now i guess yeah so you know just uh i i know we're kind of running out of time here and i'd, I'd love to just get your thoughts for the listeners but uh, a lot of our work that we do with a uh, humanum project is young people. We, we, we talk to a ton of young people, uh, young people who are mad about our culture, like just pornography, hookup culture, media, body image standards. We, we have all of this. And what I'm learning from you is all of this, they're just fruits of a deeper um, issue of a, of a different vision of the human person anthropology, uh, personhood. Um, and, and all of this has kind of been brewing, so to speak to what we, what we have now. And I I've, I've met a lot of people that are good people wanting to, they're wanting to be married. Um, which a lot of times you talk about in your book, which is we need to focus on marriage as, as rather than like personal fulfillment and romantic warm and fuzzies versus, you know, this commitment to build, uh, you know, a lifelong bond, um, family, et cetera. And so I know a lot of people, um, including myself that, that, you know, want this, but we look at our culture and it's like our culture's training and forming us not for that. And I, I mean, there's probably so many different solutions that, that you might have. We need to start here. We need to emphasize this or do this, but you know, to myself, I'm 28 other young people, 
what would you say is maybe the big takeaway from your book or something that you would give advice to me on about navigating uh, today's culture? Let me think. I'll see if I can distill it to three. Um, okay. So point number one, I don't think we need to be afraid of technology as long as it's ordered to human nature. Um, and that's a, it might, that might sound like a, an abstract heuristic, but actually if you think about it, and I'll say this directly to all of your, your young viewers, if you think about it, you, you know what, you know what, you know what you mean. You, you know what I mean by human nature. Like you can see it. You can, and like any, any kid can, can tell the difference between a man and woman by the, by the time they're about two. Um, and you know, the, the picture gets more, the picture gets more nuanced as you get older, but human nature hasn't disappeared just because we've tried to engineer it away. You know, that, that's really, that, that, that's the overall argument of my book. It hasn't gone away just because we claimed we could, we could flatten all of those differences. You know, they're, they're all still there. And if, and if you, anybody with eyes and a functioning brain can see that, all that's happened is that we've, we've abandoned the social, um, the social tools we previously used to manage those differences. But the differences themselves are still there. And if you, if you think about it, you'll realize that you can perceive them and chances are so can your friends. And chances are, if you, if you compare notes, you'll, you'll realize you're, you're all looking at basically the same stuff. So human nature is still real. <laughs> and, and, and we don't, I don't think we need to be afraid of technology, provided we see it as in service to human nature rather than as something which can wage war on human nature. The moment we're trying to use it to wage war on human nature, we're heading, no, nothing good can come of that. And uh, nothing, nothing good has as yet. And, and nothing, nothing good will come of trying to wage war on our own nature using our own tools. Cause that just leaves, if we're doing that, we're just sawing off the branch that we're sitting on. Um, so, uh, but, but, but that doesn't mean that we have to, you know, I don't know, go and live like the Amish. There's, there's no need. I mean, even the Amish don't live like the Amish. You know, you, you, there's no need to be afraid of technology. You just have to order it to human mm -hmm. nature. I mean, for, for, you know, just to take one, one fairly banal example, there are, there are, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of tech, extremely high tech tools out there that, that women use for natural family planning. Why not? You know, I mean, all, well, so, so what you're doing there is you're, you're ordering. Uh, you, you've you've taken you know, you know perhaps quite a complex set of technologies or an app or you know a, a, a different a, a whole a whole set of ways that you can you can track your physiological signals, and and you're you're employing those technologies to become more in tune with your own physiology in the interests of um, planning when or if you want to have kids. Great. I mean, what's wrong with that? So you know th this is a way of fearlessly employing technologies in service to our nature rather than rather than to wage war on it. And I can I can think of a whole bunch of other examples. Um, but that's uh, but to me that's a good heuristic for how to how to meet and engage constructively with technologies. I mean, to take an, well, I'll give you one, I'll give you one more example. Um, in the the difference between giving giving say a, a seven year old kid um, a language learning AI app on an iPad and letting them do a language learning lesson, and giving them a quote unquote AI friend. So there's a qualitative difference there. In one in the fir in the first case, they're employing uh, a, a complex, you know, large language model to to learn to learn a new skill, which they'll learn practice with other humans eventually in in, the, in real life. And in the second, you're telling them that there's no difference between the machine and 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 a, and a person. You know, those two things are qualitatively different. Um, in, they they might look like you're the, they might look like there's no difference at all. But if you think about it, you can see that one is one is ordered one is ordered to a clear distinction between the machine and the person, and the other the other the other conflates the two in a way which is which is profoundly damaging to our our, our capacity to perceive humans as human. Um, Okay, so 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 we, we don't don't be scared of technology. You just order it to human nature, and if you think about it, you you know what I mean by human nature. Like you know it when you see it, um, and and all all of you do. I I have total faith in that. Um, the the second point, oh, I've, I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> I I think the I think really the second point was that human nature is real. You know, we've we've done a, we've done our best to abolish it, but it's still there. I mean, we can all see it. Human human nature is real. Um, and it, and, and, and just don't, don't believe all the propaganda that tells you otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, just that really, um, yeah. don't believe it, believe it when you see it, because it is real, order your technologies to it. And, and finally on, on the marriage thing, um, yeah, love is something you do. I mean, this is, this is not an original point to me, but, 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 but it's something you do and it takes a lifetime. It's not something, it's not something you feel even, you know, <laughs> the time, the, the times, the times I've been most loved in my marriage have been the times when my other half wasn't feeling it. 
Um, and yet, and, and, and here we still are. So that's, that's something to think about. But, but specifically, I mean, to, to both sexes, but particularly to men, I would say, if you, if you're, if you're grappling with, you know, where you're, where you're going to find a, some sort of a helpful model for what to do, particularly if perhaps your own family life wasn't so happy or, you know, you, the world around you seems really chaotic. Um, the, the one thing I would really encourage you to do is just get offline. Uh, unplug, unplug from the, you know, don't, don't go, don't go and look for answers from Andrew Tate or even from Jordan Peterson. Um, they don't know you exist. You know, find, find a, find a good man who's older than you, um, who'll, who'll show you how to be a man. You know, if that's not your dad, then, you know, there's, find, find, find some other older guy who can show you how to be a man. Cause like, you, you're not going to learn it from women and you probably won't learn it from your, from your bros. Um, but, but there's, there are probably good men out there who've got something helpful to say on that front. Uh, but and, and you won't. But whatever happens, you won't find it on the internet. You know, get offline, unplug, go do stuff in the real world. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Thank you for the advice, and I appreciate you taking the time to to chat. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> it's been great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. We will put uh, Mary's work in the description below. So if you want to follow along with what she's up to, uh, you can check that out. All right. Thanks, everyone.